All right, we are getting there. How many people we got in? It's two past. Right. Zoom is not behaving. Give me back my Zoom instructions. There we go. Okay, so we're at 12 people. Excellent. Um, uh, that's about what we've been hitting for most sessions. So I'm going to assume that we have the majority. Do we have anybody who has joined us for the first time? Especially if you found out about it through the Florida Goldsmiths group. Anybody on? I'm going to take silence. As no, but maybe. In case there's anybody who's new to us, I'll give the super short version of my usual notes. I am not John Cogswell. This is not John Cogswell teaching you a class. This is me teaching you what I'm learning from John Cogswell's book. Um, and I've been through it a ton. I've taken a lot of classes with John. Uh, I think he's amazing and I will channel him as much as I can. But for those of you that have taken one of his classes, you know that at the end of each one, he says, fly, be free, and tells us to go teach what we've learned from him with that hand motion that he does. So um, that's what I'm trying to do. This is my homage to um, all the materials that I've learned from him and to the amazing amount of information that he has put out into the world for us. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the format, it's going to be uh, that I'll do this kind of an intro and catch us up on what we've done to date. And then I'll do a working session. And then at the end of it, we'll have a few minutes of show and tell. It doesn't have to be specific to what we're working on today, but you can show me if you've done anything with what you've covered and anything you're excited about or that you're working on yourself on your bench um, so that we can all share in the process. Um, I'm going to post a bunch of link information into the chat that is useful and the go to uh, register for actual classes of mine as opposed to this program. There are, um, this is the Facebook, my Zoom will behave. Come back here, Zoom. My goodness, it's not giving me my icons. Come on back. Zoom. Zoom. Oh my gosh, oh, there we go. I just had to click on the right thing. Um, so up in chat, if it'll come back up for me, is Port Orford Lighthouse. My goodness, I really need to get out in Oregon. Okay, so there's a boatload of links. If they will behave and post the way they're supposed to. There we go, I'm sorry, I think I posted it double. Apologies if I did. Um, as a reminder, we have a Facebook group that goes along with that isn't terribly active, but it's where you'll find a lot of guides that I wrote up for what I expect to cover through each chapter. There's some tool resources, some gemstone resources, um, some people showing off their amazing progress. Um, it's as active as you guys want it to be, and I answer it as quickly as I can if somebody posts a question, but other folks can also support that as well in answering things. Uh, I'm just not going to be happy with my Zoom today. That's what I can tell you because it's not catching up with my chat. Um, all right. And then I'm going to post here something that you'll want to take down if you did not get the Rio for Schools program coming up, which is it's changed recently about it, about eight months ago. They changed what kind of format it was. But what it does is if you are already a Rio participant, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm gonna have technology challenges all day, I can tell. Give me a second to copy the right thing. Copy, come on. Um, so Rio for Schools lets you, uh, lets you, um, get a discount as if you were a wholesale buyer, if you're not already a wholesale sale buyer. Um, so it takes a couple days to get set up and I'm going to give you the directions if chat will come back to me. There's maybe. Nope, it doesn't want to behave. Let me bring chat back. Maybe we'll try this later in the session because it's really being obnoxious. Whether it's my mouse or my... Well, oh I've been fighting with IT all day long, so it's probably me and I've jinxed you. I am IT in my <laughs> other career, so I should be able to get this to work. I don't know what's going on. Let me try dragging the Zoom down to my second screen. I think it may be behaving badly because of the second screen. 
Sorry, guys. It's just going to annoy me if I don't get it so that I can see all the things. <laughs> you should see what's happening on my screen, guys. The chat is bouncing all over the place. Ooh. It's not staying put where I need it to stay put. It's not letting me copy what I need to copy. There we go. Let's try one more time. Copy and paste. There we go. Rio for schools. It's not my Wi-Fi, I don't think. Um, did that pop up for you guys? There we go. So that's the how you do it. And there, that code R-F-S-R-M-O-R-R -R -R is the code you'll put in for me. Even if you've done this from other instructors, you can put me in so that they know to associate me. And that means that if ever you're taking one of my classes where I set up a shopping list with them or something like that, they'll associate it properly. So you can go looking for, for materials lists and things like that. It doesn't give you double credit, unfortunately. You still just get the regular discounts. Um, and it's on a certain subset of products. Basically, it's as if you are Rio Pro for six months um, at their base level of Rio Pro. So you get some discounts. Um, if you haven't seen it go into effect by two days after, you should probably call their tech support. Um, but that is open to anybody who's doing any of these sessions. And then upcoming workshops. Um, this weekend, if you feel like a last minute class, we do still have spots in the Hollow Form Forms workshop from Friday to Sunday. Um, next will be the um, clasps from Simple to Structural, which I'm doing virtually for Metalworks. Um, that's July 16th and 17th. It's only a two-day class. They asked me to trim it back because their schedule is pretty full right now. And then in November will be Bezels Less Ordinary, which is playing around with things that we get out of this and taking them to the next level, plus a couple of settings that John doesn't cover in his book. Um, so those are all available on the links under my class instruction area. Any questions about that ramble of an introduction? Have you pinned yourself? I did pin myself. I remembered. I put it in my direction sheet for myself this time because I keep forgetting. Okay. So I am pinned. But you'll have to remind me again if I pin anybody else to show off their stuff in the ending session. All right. um, yes, thank you. Okay. Any I other usually remember to tell you that. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I will never object to hearing it again at the beginning of any session. And if anybody's new, remember you're allowed to hop on and just unmute yourself and ask questions, um, pop, pop things into chat. When I'm on the bench, it's a little harder for me to grab it, but I'll see it eventually. Um, and, uh, and don't hesitate to participate. That's what I'm actually asking you to do. Um, let's see, did I cover all my intro notes? I did. So... I have been, one of the few things I managed to get done since last time was to organize the chart, the master chart, a little bit better than it had been. So let me see if I'm going to get this right. So we are working our way through all of chapter three, and there's still only two gaps. Uh, I tried to get my triangle and emerald done, but I, between the shows and my other stuff, I've been too busy. So I will fill those in because certainly we're not getting all of these set today. So I have a little bit of time still. Um, but you'll see we've got a whole array of different settings, all from this chapter three bezel setting. Um, and what we've done in the last couple that weren't up on the board but have been added now are two different types of the basic tube setting, one that's just drilled in using burrs, and the other that is the nested tubes. We finished up that double bezel, which has a ring inside of it um, to hold both points. Um, we finished up the uh, bullet cap, which we did two ways, and I've actually done a third because I wanted to show it a little bit better than these teeny ones do. So one of them is done with a ring inset into it, a jump ring inset, and the other is done with a wall. I'm just going to show better on the big one, with the wall like a basic tube. So we get a little cap out of that. Um, and then we went into the tongue bezels, and I again did two versions of it. This is the one that we did in session, which has the full cowboy hat on. And I did a version where I trimmed back the hat so that it's a little more subtle, so that we can see the difference in those two. Um, last session we did a castellated bezel, or maybe it was the session before, it's a bit of a blue. So we had done a, a basic castellated bezel, which must have been this one, because it's got the little curves. I've also got one that is just a straight saw 
with no curvature. So we can see the difference in how it sets down when we take more material away or less at the top of things. Oh, this is what we did last session. So that was from two sessions ago. So last session we did the um, reverse settings. So we've got one that has a cap to it. And I have, since the session, I decided that I didn't like the flat cap. It was not giving me a sense that it would hold the stone well. So I did uh, remake the cap that I did during last session to be a little bit more curved and more in keeping with the drawings that John has given us. Um, so all it was is the same doming process that we used on our earlier um, settings for the um, upright, for the cup, for the bullets. So these over here, same process. I just made the right sized circle and domed it until I got it where I wanted. I didn't have to add anything interior and I put a little jump ring on there so that it can hang down. We also did a reverse um, setting where we were making the inner ring and then it's going to be set from behind. And so this one is going to come up from the bottom. And the only thing that I hadn't gotten to in last session was to make a little jump ring so that we could have the option to use the jump ring. I'm not showing that very well. To use the jump ring to hold it in place when we do that setting. But you can now see that I finished the filing on that one and it's going to just poke through. And this is this would, I would not actually design this for a tiny little circle of metal. This little circle of metal, remember, is representing it being in a much bigger pendant or a pair of earrings or something like that. So this is just so that we can see what it looks like with that 16 gauge that he recommended for the surface area that it was, that it's pushing through. So our setting is all from behind on that one. Um, and so those were the last two that we did. I just, um, on these other two that are hit, sitting here, I had uh, remembered that I hadn't put out some variations on the bezels that have the prong sets and so on. So I figured I'd tack them on there. So today we're doing the last of the settings described in the book. And this is gonna be a super challenging one for me because I have not ever done one of these. And I'm not entirely convinced that his drawings and his words match up on this one. <laughs> so we're gonna play a little bit to discover that. Um, any questions before I get into that uh, setting, which is on page 84, bezel for teardrop stones. Any questions on the stuff we've got on the board thus far? Um, actually, do you think you could center that in the screen and I can take a screenshot? <laughs> Sure. I can also, I can post a photograph to Instagram oh, okay. or something of the whole thing. I just haven't had time to do my social media thing. But let it's me see. Not, the chart. not to Instagram. Pa pardon? Post it to your Facebook, not to, not to Instagram. Oh, okay. I will post it both places because that's how I roll. Okay. I, have a, I use Planoly, so it should post to everything. Um, but that, I think, mostly shows everything a little bit. I'm going to be falling off the edge over here. Yep, it's good. Okay, so that's uh, that's to date and one more to go. I wish I hadn't put these here because then I could have finished it all in one row, but that's my anal retentive nature. Um, any questions about any of the settings and where they stand? Okay. Um, I have a question because I was trying to finish the one today. Sure. And it's the one that's backwards. On okay, which 83? On 83, the so the yeah, so this one that we're working on, yep. Yeah, I got totally confused. I didn't know what I had to do. I mean, I was putting the bullet through, but then it didn't fit. It fit better like with the ring in there, and that was yeah. it. I had a lot of fight with the filing on this, excuse me, while I duck down and grab the bullet I've just dropped. Um, so I am somewhat inclined to say that this is not well described in the book okay. because I was fighting with it too and I had to do a heck of a lot more filing and grinding than I expected to. So what I, because I was not getting the steep enough angle for my particular bullet shape. And what I don't know is whether it works better with a more subtle bullet. Like I don't have any gentler slopes to, to play with. I don't have a, just a tall cab 
instead of a full bullet shape. Um, so what I think is the challenge in this one is that um, you not only have to pre, remember we pre-filed the loop that we set inside as the back plate and got a good angle on it, but it wasn't all there was to it. John is counting on you continuing the angle into, I'm gonna put my hands in screen, continuing the angle into this, what it becomes the front plate, right? And that's where I personally had the most difficulty getting the angle I wanted. So what I did in the end, when I couldn't get my, I couldn't get my files small enough at the right angle, is I went in with a, uh, um, a, uh, what kind of burr did I use? I used a barrel burr and I was able to get in at an angle to continue the grind where I wasn't, because what I, what was happening was I was filing it and it wasn't staying nice and circular. So it was looking all wonky to me. So mm -hmm. I ended up taking burrs and figuring out which ones would get me the cleanest hole first. So I, I circle, I just did a regular bit to clean up the hole. So it was round. And then I took the barrel burrs and I was able to just barely put them in at the angle that I needed to continue from the little ring inside. Thank you for asking that because I would have forgotten to talk about it. Um, and so that got me here, but I'm still a little displeased with how much of the stone is stuffed away in this setting. And what I can't tell is whether that's my design, whether it's the angle of the stone being so steep, like if I had, if I'd started out with a bigger ring, but I mean, we followed the directions in terms of making it to the size of the base of the bullet. So I'm not sure whether I could get it bigger without it just falling through the other side ultimately. And yeah, so that's I think- that's what I was concerned. Yeah, yeah I was I concerned think, with that too. I think it's, I want to find, next time I go stone shopping, I'm going to try and find some just high domed um, tabs instead of full on bullets and see if that makes a difference to this. Um, but it's not been one of my favorite settings so far. We'll see how it looks once it's actually set in nice and snug. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so you are not alone in that fight that you're finding. All right, because I was like, oh, no, this isn't happening. <laughs> yeah, and it is It is important that it be a very snug fit, so it's tiny amounts of change in each filing and or grinding that you're doing. Um, and I'm really, really counting on that ring. It's one of the reasons I made the ring, because the other option is to make this serrated sort of the same way we had to do on some of the uh, on some of the conicals because that's in essence what we're bumping up against um, but I realize I want to see how it works against the ring because mechanically having a curved surface in there to push against makes more sense to me than trying to push metal over the flat back of my bullet so this is going to be an interesting one to set and remember that little jump ring had better be super super tight I learned in my very first John class, which was two clasps in two days, that when he says you need it precision fit, he ain't kidding. And this is one of those ones that you should precision fit. It needs to be a little hard to get into the back of the, of the setting. Um, that was a clasp of his that he designed that is a toggle clasp that um, the, it's a, a car, sorry, it's called a knocker clasp where it's a ring that a bar with a ball on the end of it snaps into place to hold it there. And it has six different size jump rings in it, all ever so slightly different sizes from each other. And um, that, that just making those stupid jump rings took us the better part of the day. So it's a beautiful class. I can make them faster now, but it was a learning exercise. Any other questions about the magic that is chapter three thus far? Okay, I'm gonna put the board aside until we're ready to set. And we're gonna adventure into the land of the teardrop bead or briolette. You could do a briolette with this. Briolette's just a faceted version of a teardrop. Um, and so I've chosen one. So I have several that are bigger than this, but they were really fat, like bumblebee shaped ones. And when I started trying to lay out the chart the way that he said to, I found that the little guys were easier. They wanna roll around like crazy. So I went and I grabbed 
my wolf um, uh, soft wax. I'll get the exact name of it. I think I've got it up on the Facebook group um, and just took a little pinch of it so that I can put a snippet so that I can hold my stone in place. And I'm gonna talk through what I think he says we should do in this book, as opposed to what he's showing us in the pictures. Um, and maybe you guys can help me come up with the math that we should be doing for this. Uh, Rachel? Yep. yep. So does this work if the briolette is drilled then? You just put yes. the setting over top? You do, but you can do an added bonus that's not in the book that makes it even more stable, which is just like if you were setting a pearl in a cup, you could center a little post. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is a drilled piece here. You don't want a full drill, probably. There's no real reason to go to the effort of making a full, well, I mean, you could, but it, it, I wouldn't probably do anything that had a full drill as a plain soldered cup. I'd probably just run it through and put a decorative element down instead of trying to hold the stone with the cone if it were fully drilled. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I, I've got a full drill on mine and I could just as easily put a little peg at the top of my um, setting as I, as I wouldn't, you know, he's got versions where we grind away the edge of the stone and things like that. Um, but you can also do a, a post. Um, just as a reminder on posts, when you're doing them, you really want to, um, uh, give some thought to doing it as a square wire post that you then twist um, because the spiral will hold more surface area glue. It's one of the, when you're doing a peg, um, there's, there's basically three ways to peg a pearl. One is, um, uh, one is to just put a straight peg in glue. Another is to do that square twist. I'm waving at you like you guys can see me. So the, the twisted square wire gives you more surface area and more grip inside the small hole of the pearl or the bead. And then there's the way that makes it so that the next jeweler that comes along actually has to cut the pearl off. And that's to do a wedge inside of a split post. And what happens is if you get a tight, you get a post that you cut in half, you put the wedge down, a tiny sliver of wedged metal, silver or whatever you're working in, and then by pushing the pearl down onto it, it pushes the edge of the post out and locks it in because it's now too wide to get pulled back out. Um, and that version is the true pearl setting way, but it's also, if you go, if it breaks, if it chips, if, it, if you've got to do any work on the piece, including touch-up soldering, you're going to have to literally cut the pearl off of the piece and um, resolder a new post on. So I tend to go with that square wire twist thing as my default um, whenever possible. And I would do that in this case too, if I were putting a center post in. Um, good question, by the way. Any others on the prep for this? Okay, so we're going to talk through what I think he has told us in the book. And you guys are going to help me figure out whether I'm missing something. So the gist of this is that we have to decide where our setting is going to land when the cone is made. Because we're about to make a cone that fits like this, right? Pin. Pin. Thank you. Or, or just wrong screen. I just had the wrong one up. Let me see if I can get the glow out of the way. Go. It's a little better. Okay, so we've got a, uh, a teardrop stone and we're going to be building a cap for it. I like how casual he is about how tall we want it. Basically, how tall do you want it? So deciding where it's going to go that'll hold enough of the stone without hiding too much of the stone beneath it. Thus why you might want to do your first one on a larger stone because this is going to be itty bitty to deal with. So in making our measurements for the cap, what he has described to us is a little different than what I'm seeing in the picture. So we trace the stone and then we decide where we're putting, where we want our cap to land. And then we're using that as the basis for our curvature. So we put a compass in and we create this curvature. But the next thing he talks about is going out three steps from the width that we're doing. So my initial translation of that was that it should go in each direction. 
there should be three because to me that makes the conical shape that we're talking about. But his drawings, his, and his drawings kind of indicate that, but then his words say that we're going out three. And so I'm starting to doubt and think maybe we need to go one, two, three, but that doesn't make sense to me mathematically. It, it feels like it's gonna get way too long for a curve. So I think I've got this right. I'm just doubting it when I actually put it down on the piece of paper because it looks so itty bitty. And I feel like it, it, his drawing also shows not just three, but a little bit more than three. When you look at the bottom number five, transfer to metal, and number four, he's saying do it three times, but he's showing us three and a half, which makes more sense to me mathematically because we're getting closer to pi. Well, I took it as you don't count that center one and then you put one on the left and two on the right. Even though he's clearly showing one of the two on the right as narrower? I think that's just a uh, perspective in his drawing. Okay. All right, so we're actually doing four total. That makes it go even further around. So I've traced, I've put the line at which I want to mark this off, and this is gonna be my, my width of that I need to multiply by. And I'm taking from the point, oh, by the way, even if you don't have a full point on your bead, you're gonna to wanna to make your cone go up, as, make your drawing go up as if it were a full point. Okay, because you need to represent the top of your cone when it comes in. And so, oops, I'm way off on my mark. Let me go in on my compass. I, need, I really need to get a better quality compass than I have. This one is not terribly precise. So in doing this, I'm picking the midpoint. Come on. The midpoint, because if I do it off to one side, I'm going to go beyond. I guess maybe it doesn't much matter which way, where I start it. And so I'm making the curve that follows that. Just move the paper, it'll be cleaner. Maybe. But what happens when I do that is I get a much wider, so he's drawing something that ends up looking like this, but what I'm getting is something that ends up looking like it curves around a lot more than his does. So, I'm going to see what happens. And for that very reason, I've got um, some metal foil that I'm going to lay it out on before I cut it out in the full scale uh, silver. So if we're saying that we're going, you're, you're, you're proposing two on one side and one on the other, Wendy. I'm going to try. Well, this. that's just how I read it. I don't. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm interested because at least your, your version of it gets us to the closer to the pie that I was thinking we were going to get. So there's one and there's eight. You know how much I love measuring things. So that's one. And then if we have to continue our circle, my compass. We're going to find this out pretty quickly once we hit the practice metal. That's one. A great idea to put it on that metal first. Yay. Yeah. So for those of you that haven't seen this, I got this idea from Jane Redman. And this is what's called florist's foil, which is heavier than tin foil. And if you go on Amazon and search for it, you can find stuff that has the silver and the gold, which is far superior when you're trying to model a design because it'll tell you where you're working front and back on your metal. It's fantastic stuff. I'll try to dig up the uh, the uh, indicate you know the link that I use on Amazon. So now what I'm doing is I'm going from my end points back to my corner, and I definitely have a much bigger circle than his drawing represents, right? So that's one, two, this one that we're saying is the main line, and then three. And I'm going to cut out this itty bitty little pattern and transfer it over to the metal. We will see what we learn.
teeny tiny little thing. All right, so that's our potential pattern looking absolutely not like John's drawings. <laughs> I'm going to transfer it over to trace to this. And when I'm working with this and I want to trace, I use a small, um, either like a quilting needle or uh, if I can find it, because I just cleaned up, um, just a small scribe so that I can, oh, there we go, perfect. So something like that, which just gives me a point that I can press down with if I don't blow the piece away. There we go. So that I can score my material enough to measure it. And for this, I don't have to be super precise because this is my, is it going to do what we think it's going to do when we curl it up? Looks like a little Pac-Man right now. And I'm sure that somebody out there knows more math about how to figure out this curvature than I do. Um, I'm sure there's an easy mathematical formula. Just I'm not up to that right now. Okay, so we now have this piece. And if I were to close it into roughly a cap, which I can now take one of my mandrels and put it onto the mandrel that sort of get the, the shape. What we discover is that I'm probably one segment too big because when I overlap, I have that much left and I'm still bigger than I need to be. So I think it isn't the three out total. I think it, that, that center one must be inclusive because what I'm seeing is I've got at least one width's worth of overlap. <laughs> Good to know. Yep. So see, that's how much, I don't know if that's, is that too small for you guys to see or is it showing? I've folded up the little piece of this that is the excess. Do you see where that circle of light is reflecting on your whiteboard? Yeah. Put, put the little cone in that piece of light and let's see. Oh, this is like playing a video game because the light <laughs> is, um, I can't tell where I'm going. Let's see, in the cone <laughs> of light. Up. up. Uh, to your uh, right, right. Uh, there you go. Oh well, more. Like, here, let right. me bring it over to the uh, close, the close-up camera on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one of those challenges that you do in uh, like team building exercises. You guys have to guide me to where I'm. Follow the light, Rachel. Follow the light. Uh, is that going to get too fuzzy? So here, what we did was. Um, about one panel's worth extra. Still too close for you guys to be able to see. And so, you did four. I'm sorry. I did you four, did yeah. Four, right? so I, think that, I think it truly is three. So it's three. Just oh, it's it. um, out of screen. Oh, thank you. Um, now, now it's in material that makes it look like you can't see it. So. So at three makes mathematical sense to me in a broad sense, because we are aiming for a circle. 3.14 is probably where we want to be by the time we're done wrapping it around that dimension. Um, John tends to do a lot of the ballpark method like I like. Um, so I'm, I think this is an interpretation issue. And what we're seeing is cut off that fourth piece. Um, but the description he gives kind of makes you want to do it out in a line. So don't. Um, I'm going to go back to the board and re-mark this one up from the ground up so that we can get a full, clean measurement of it using that approach. I have a question about that whole measurement. Um, yep. So because it's three extra, would you put it inside to solder it inside? Or would you, are you going to solder it like metal to metal? Instead the of stone? like stone, would I put the stone in to, to, to solder it? No, no. The piece oh. that you just did overlap. Would that go inside to solder instead of trying to make it flush? I no, guess you'll see in the in the next steps, we're gonna actually trim it up to true. He's having us over measure so that we have room to trim it back flush because the um, we're gonna just like anything that we're curving around, we're gonna have squaring off as we curve it. 
Okay. Right? So we're going to need to flush these up. And he mm -hmm. talks about how we go to that in, in a, a step or two from where we are now. Well, that okay. was my concern uh, reading it. And he says, file one side with a true edge. And I'm going, how do you do that? So, yeah. So was once, it's, <laughs> once it's wrapped around, true edge is really relative to where you are because we've curved it. So we're doing this to file it. And then when we bring the other edge that is now, let's see, let me see. Right. So once you've filed one true edge, you have this, and then you have this, right? So what he's going to have us do is just like on other things, we saw it together. When they're crunched together, we saw it to get our true, true, or at least matched because the saw blade makes the match kind of fitting. So that's the, that's my interpretation of that activity that he describes. Um, I will remind you of something that I constantly forget, and it's because I really just need a better design of pencil, but don't do your drawing like this. Don't angle your pencil the way you would if you were writing a letter to somebody. You want to be upright when you're tracing because otherwise you introduce angles that you didn't mean to from the curvature of the stone, especially on something like this where there's an undercut that you could accidentally curve under. So really just confirm that you are tracing as up and down as you can to get a true, a true model of the design. Um, and then this one, again, it doesn't have that top point. So what I'm doing is I'm extrapolating to the point and cleaning it up so that I make sure I have a decent frame of it. It looks huge compared to the bead. But I think that's part of what gives us our little extra of why we only need three is it goes over a little bit. I'm going to decide. I, I've been going with about a third of the way down as my point for making my cross line. That's where I, I don't want to cap more than a third of the stone, but you, your mileage may vary. And of course, this is one of those ones that we could fancy up. So if you wanted to make it taller, and then knowing that later you're going to do something decorative, like make a scallop out of it, file a scallop in, you absolutely could give yourself more material and cut it away at a later stage of this process. So, but we're going to go good and basic because I personally have not done a basic one or any. So we're going to get that lined up. I also found that it was useful to give myself my center line. And that tells me, here's my width. And then I'm going to take the mediocre grade compass, putting it at the point. That's why I drew my point up, because even though my bead doesn't end there, my cone will, right? My cone has to go fully conical. So I go up to the point and then down to the spot that, I, that my center point is. I'm doing my circle drawing which is with this compass so much easier to move the board than the compass, <laughs> which is really awkward, but it gets me a decent thing. You could also, if you have a circle template, you could also just find the right size circle template and do that, I suppose. And then we're measuring, I'm going to mark this with a different color so that you guys can see it. We're measuring from here to here, right? That width. And the part of the thing that's a little tricky on this is that you want to follow the curvature. So like, I don't want to do this out here. I want to do it along the curvature to make sure that I'm meeting what I need to on both sides. So I'm going from point to point along the curve. My curve needs to go up a little higher on this side, I think. So this is where I end. Okay, and then I'm cutting it back to my point, excuse me, on both sides. And I'm going to cut that template out and see how we're doing. Modeling your design is always useful, especially if you're trying something new like I am here. This also feels like a setting that becomes radically easier once you figure out the aha component of it. 
like if we get the how do we really get close to this measurement the way we want to i think then suddenly it becomes a little bit more obvious all the rest of it oops i didn't trim it quite well that's close enough for the sake of our mock-up okay so once again putting it down on a little piece of the material this is great stuff if you're if you're doing um if you're testing hydraulic press tools and stuff because you can at least get a sense of the impression that you're getting um and if you're trying to get some fold forming shape concepts out of it it folds nicely doesn't take the hammer effect that a true fold form would do but it's really a handy dandy little piece of material it's probably bad for me to be using my actual scissors on this. My sewing companions are probably screaming at me. Okay, so we now have a smaller loop that when we go back to, as I put down my forming tool. When we go back to the forming tool and start to shape it around much, much closer to the size we want. Still overly large, so now we're seeing that extra one-third. It's, it's, it's actually quite larger than it needs to be, so I can't tell whether that's my lack of measuring skills or not but either way just by having this material i can trim my model back enough that i can make it closer to what i need by the time i'm done so i'm going to take about half of one of those lengths i did off which will leave me with just enough overlap to try and model it and it'll account for the fact that this is done in thin material and i'm about to put it in 24 gauge which will make some of the curvature I mean, some of the overlap be a little bit more spread out. So I've got what would be quite a cute little cap size on there. This is a good time to check your design and decide if that goes far enough down for what you want. That looks like a pretty good amount to me for this particular design. I could probably go a little smidge bigger if I wanted to, but I'm now going to use this as my template. No, I'm not, because that's a little messy from the way I trimmed it. Let's see. Still is true to my sizing. So what I've got now just barely overlaps when I go across. I've got about a millimeter of extra overlap, which gives me enough room to measure and adjust when I need to. So I'm happier with that template. I want to see how it looks compared to, so it's still disconcerting to me that his design has more of a splay. And the other thing that is disconcerting to me is that as drawn, but not as described in the book, he has a top cutaway. So I feel like there's something missing in the description yeah. of the taper that he's talked about in here. So what do I think that means? Do you think it's because the stone he was using was bigger? Like, is that how it would translate? I don't. I think he. What I think what he's doing in his drawing that we have not done in ours so far is accounting for when we curl up a gauged metal that's thicker in order to get a point at the top. It's going to need some some room for the for wrapping it around. So I'm betting that if I cut it out without that, I'll run into myself on the wrap around. Um, and so I'm going to want to take a piece out. But what I don't know is whether that means I need more length. I think I have a sneaking suspicion I need to go taller than I think in order to give myself that cutaway room. So I'm going to 
one more try at this design, but I'm going to give myself a little more leeway. So once again, I'm trying to stay as upright as possible with the pencil. Could the little hole be because if you look at page 85, there's the wire coming through. Well, no, not really, but there's it's a not. Hole. It looks like a jump ring on top. So I think this has yeah. got that, that curve that this piece up at the top has to be about what happens when you form it into a full cone. So I, we've got to account for it, even though he doesn't describe doing it in the book. So this is another one of those settings where we're going to have to sort of come to our own conclusions about the intent based on his drawings. So I was doing about a third of the way. Pardon? Sorry, you, could, you could still see it like in number 10. On number... A, a picture number 10 on 85, there's a little hole on the top. Yeah, but then by the time we get to 11, magically it's gone. Yeah. Okay. So I Maybe wonder make if two. Could, pardon? Maybe make two. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if also that, because uh, the, the mandrel that he's truing it up on looks a little bit more steep than the actual stone he's setting it on. So that may be the difference as well is that we're truing it tight. And then by the time we then fold it back into a cone, you know, pull it out to the size of the bead, it may need a little more leeway. Or it could just be that what he was drawing when he was drawing versus what he was thinking about when he was typing were two different things. So I'm going to go closer to the halfway mark down this just to give myself a little more leeway because that'll also let me take that bit off the top. And I'll try one more time with my fabulous skills using the compass. Out of here for a second. Easier. And if anybody's got a different technique for making this kind of cone than what we're going through with John's process, I am super interested to hear more about it. This feels a little awkward so far. And maybe that's just that I haven't done it because I should remember that it always feels awkward the first time you do something. And I'm cutting back to the center point. Close. Again, I think this is going to be oversized. But then we take away a reasonable amount from this. Draw that approximation. So trace this one out in red so you guys can see a little better what I've done. Well, I have some bolo ties and the bolo ties, when you put the bottom tips, which have yep. the cone shape, when I put the stone in, cause I was looking at them just cause of the book idea. Um, it doesn't go all the way to the top. Well, it doesn't, isn't that because the bolo, oh, you mean at the bottom, like the point that's hanging down doesn't close all the way? I wonder if that's because you need to be able to thread things in or if that's a stylistic choice. No, the stone itself doesn't go all the way in. Huh. Okay. I mean, I could show you later when I'm talking. Yeah, about. yeah. When we do show and tell, please bring that out. I'm going to fold this to get the inner one just a little bit out of the way. Okay. Third time's the charm. 
turn this, which looks a little bit cleaner than the prior ones, into our metal template. Would you try it around the stone before you put it on the template? Use that sure. paper around the yeah, stone. I can do that, absolutely. I've got a little bit of sticky stuff even to hold it there while I do. <laughs> but it's not sticky enough to keep me from dropping it. So again, I still have a little bit of overlap. And I will have a tiny hole at the top that I think will be closed in when we have thicker metal than the paper. So I'm feeling much better about this design. And it seems to be a blend of what he's described and what we see on the page. It's a little closer to the drawing shape that we end up with. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Skeptically hopeful. I'm always skeptically hopeful. Okay, where is my little tool for shaping it around? Okay, once again, it's looking a little bit more like his drawings. Let's see how it does. But I still got a lot of excess on this design. But I think that I, uh, I'm going to leave all that excess. I've got about what I would consider about two thirds of one of our segments extra on this, but I'm going to leave it until I've cut it out of the silver to see how much I need material wise to make the, uh, the to, to account for the, the gauged metal. Okay. So there's that. And that's an actual template that I'm going to work off of. I can get it back open. Um, I could also see, once you've got this, I could also see punching a circle with your circle punch that's the right size and then cutting away the excess to get a super clean curvature to your circle. Um, I might try that in a later edition. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to mark this one out. Find the right sharpie. There we go. And this is 24 gauge. So as I've said in earlier sessions, that means I'm going to cut it with shears. Um, if it were thicker, if I can find my shears. That's what happens when I clean up. I can't find anything. There they are. There's some in my papers. Um, if it were thicker gauge, I would saw it. But with 24 gauge, the bonsai shears do the trick. I might need to get out the saw for the little inset piece, or I might be able to punch it out with a punch tool. And he tells us we can do 24 or 22 gauge. Um, I chose 24 because it's such a small stone, but I imagine it's just sort of a scale of what it'll look like against the stone, because the thicker the metal, the more it'll lift away from the stone. 
um, meaning there'll be more of like a lip between the stone and the wall of the bezel. So, fling my stuff out my nose. There we go. All right. So the only little piece in the center is the one I need to get rid of. Rough cut it with the shears and then come back in with a round file to get that. I'm going to clean these up with a series of both small and large files. Doesn't need a heck of a lot from where we are because we're not quite ready to have it truly clean. But I'm going to just make sure I have a decent round hole in the center. I give myself a little bit of work there. And then I'm going to do a pass just to get my curvature a little cleaner from the cut that I just did. So in this, I'm using my barrette file. I've said in past sessions that if I were on a desert island and only could have one file, it would, I would be taught, it would be a toss up between the barrette and the crossing file. Um, Barrette is just much more flexible than a traditional flat file in terms of being able to get into places without wrecking the other side of your work. And this is one of those things where I do a little more wrist work than I would do on traditional filing. I'm trying to get follow the curve. So I tend to do a little flick to make sure that I'm basically my hand is going in the same direction as the curve that I'm filing, basically, when I do that. That's not apparent from what I'm showing you on screen. Straightening up my flat cuts. So that starts out well, but a little bit still lifting up from cutting. So we now have a piece made in the, for, in the fine silver, I mean, in the sterling silver. And we're supposed to now use, did he say half rounds or rounds? He wants a round plier on this one. So round flats, which I figure out where I've managed to stash my round So flat. again, Rachel, back to my question. He says okay. to uh, file one edge with a true edge. So oh, thank you. Thank you for not missing that. Did he say to do that before we've curved it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So then maybe he is asking us to do just square it up. So then I've already done that by cutting straight across. Yeah. And the true both of them. Okay. Yep. Um, I just have to figure out where I have put my flat round pliers. Oh, they're just facing backwards. There we go. So I'm just using flat rounds and starting to do this curvature that he's describing. And the cone in the pliers, I'm trying to stay sort of in line with the angles of the, of the material. So, dropsy today like crazy. Where did it go? There it is. Dropping wax, dropping stones, dropping the cone. Let's see. So we're just roughing it at this point. And this is uh, another benefit of having that little hole cut out of the top is that I can get my pliers in the hole space. So that's handy. That would not be as easy if it didn't have that. Yeah. Yep. Rachel, Question? did you, did you, I just have a comment under, uh, in the next sentence, it says to aid shaping and fitting saw off the last one to two millimeters of the pointed tip. Oh, that's where he's telling us to take the, okay. Yeah. So we start the, yeah. it, he puts the hole in after we've made it conical. I didn't read up that 
No, well. no, no. He puts it in before. But how can he roll it off the oh of that went? But there is no tip. That's the problem. So until it's <laughs> rounded, you're right. <laughs> there's no tip to cut off. So I'm confused. Um, so I'm going to keep going with the curving what I've got and seeing where it gets me. And I'm going to I'm getting to the point where I have enough overlap that I need to put it on a mandrel of some kind. I think I had a few different mandrels out because that one felt too steep and too wide rather because this is still way, way bigger than I need it to be for my itty bitty little stone. It's got a lot of extra room right now and I need to round it out a bit. Which I'm gonna try to do without squishing my own fingers. So this is just a plum bob. In fact, I think it may have actually come from John. He dumped a bunch of tools on me when he was cleaning out his studio, which I did not object to in the least. This is definitely not the right shape for this to be formed on. Let's try a bigger one. A lot easier to do in foil than it is in silver, I'll tell you that, guys. Okay, we're getting closer. It's still fairly large for the size of our bead. And so I need to um, start overlapping or trimming it away. And I'm also finding I probably need to anneal this because it's a little too stiff. So I'm going to pop over to the bench block, do a quick anneal. Yay, we're at the top of page 85. Are we? All right, so we've got our piece. We're gonna do a little more flexing with it, with pliers and the forming tools. Dry off device. It's gotten to be the, to the point where I don't remember the word towel, so that's a good sign for a Wednesday. Doesn't bode well for the rest of my week. <laughs> um, so, oh, much better. So that makes it a lot easier to get my flex around and get it more to the shape that I need for this specific size of bead. One of the challenges I'm finding is that it does not really want to evenly wrap. It's kind of taking the bottom edges, torquing around more than the top. So I'm gonna go back to hammering, which seemed to give me a little bit more control over that. This is too wide of a dome for what I want. So let's go back on to something smaller. And I'm gonna play around with a couple different pliers to try and encourage it past that point because it doesn't really want to Hold nicely. There we go. That's going to do a little better. And this is really definitely going to turn out to be about making sure you have a few different curvatures. So you can, I hope you can see that I'm getting very close to the right size, but I need it even snugger than it already is. Um, so I'm going to work with the pliers now that it's folded over, trying to push it a little further past. And just using the pliers to manipulate the cone so that it stays constant. 
a good sign in this, which is kind of cool, is that the, the flat surface of the base of the cone is staying fairly in line with itself, as opposed to I've done cone cutting jobs where I end up with it sort of splayed out much taller on one side than the other, but this is looking reasonably consistent throughout. We're going to do some sanding and filing to it after we get it fully conical and soldered. Um, so the hole that I made is probably a little more than I needed to. Um, but I'm also not objecting to it. It can give me something to hang it on. And we're starting to get very close. So I think what I want to do is cut away down the, down the seam line. And then I'll file and close it more tightly as we move our way through it. So now the trick is holding it in place for such a precise little tiny filing. I mean, sawing. Mark it so that I can see what I'm doing. And this is going to be cutting through both uh, ends at once so that I get a clean seam in case it's tight enough. And Wax. Still in screen for you guys. I know this is tiny, tiny work that I'm doing right now. How do I do it without sawing my own fingers? Trick. Okay, so we've got a fairly snug fit on the cone. If I can get those closed together where the saw line happened. Now I need to see if that was close enough for my cap. And I think the answer is I need to take a little bit more off of it. I may need to now get rid of the wax that's getting in the way of properly sizing this or at least push it down a ways. So let me bring this over to the close screen to the zoom in so you can see what I'm seeing, which is that I've still got a little wiggle room around the around the angle of the bead. Let's see how I can get that at an angle that will show for you guys. showing there's a little bit too much it's like having a sixth grader i mean a six-year-old with a loose tooth still so i want to get my starting point to be a lot snugger than that so i'm going to go in and get, it's close enough that i think this is probably an exercise in snugging it up and then sawing it again snugging and sawing because i'm using the saw in that case as a file um, and this is, is it just as loose at the top or is it? It is. Just, it is. Okay. Yeah. It's that the angle is not fully followed. Yeah. Good question. Whether, so if, if it's, if it's looser at the top than the bottom or vice versa, then you probably didn't get your curvature and your angle set the way you think you did because it should be following the shape you drew with your teardrop initially. Does that make sense? Yeah. If it's, if it's wider at the top than at the bottom, you either either that or you have since cut it at a different angle than you thought you did. Just a smidge out. Close it together further. I'm going to put it back on whichever of my Daps was the closest to the shape. It's too steep. A little Goldilocks action here. One is too narrow and one is too wide. This one. Okay. 
gosh, my fingers are not small enough for this tiny little work. So what I'm trying to do now is get that, now that I've got sawn through again, I just need to close up, tighten up my seam. So that if I were to solder it, it, it wouldn't have gapping. And I'm gonna also use my pliers to sort of even out the where it's a little off on the curve. It's got a flat side to it right now. Let's see how that's looking for the current stone. All right, I'm gonna do one more pass because it is still a little bit wobbly. So this sawing approach seems to be a good one for trimming this down a step at a time when you're really, really close already. Come on. Sometimes you just gotta unstring the saw. Pass. Let's see what we got. A little bit. And once again, got to snug it back up from what we just cut. It's tight fit. Nope, I still want to take one more layer out. So I'm going to get it to overlap a little bit more. more snugly. Do another saw. This does make me want to run out to my hardware store and start looking for every steel conical device I can possibly find to get the angles I want. You know, Wubbers has a conical plier. Oh, yeah? So the, the problem is, with, as with any other tool that we would choose, it still depends on whether it matches the angle you're working on. So it's the stone yeah. angle that drives it. So um, yeah, I would definitely, Wubbers makes some cool tools. They have some very distinctive things, but I think I'd probably need three Wubbers. Darn, that would be terrible if I had three different conical angles. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into the um, crown settings next, next chapter, because there are two fairly standard angles that a lot of crowns and other conicals are set at. Because uh, we could be doing this, by the way, in the same tool that I did last session in our bezel block. Um, but it, ha again, runs into the, is it the right angle for us? Um, and 17 degrees, and I'm not going to remember off the top of my head what the other angle is. It's a common one. 30, maybe? Um, I'm not sure I'm happy with this yet. I think I still want to take a bit more away. Bear with me, gang. We need to get a fairly close fit for this particular look to work for us. Because remember that two of the ways of setting this, one is the magic of glue or a post, as we talked about with glue, either one. But the other one that he's describing in, in this is to cut a segment into the stone, which you have to grind away. And that segment sits just under the wide end of the cone, and then you push the cone around that, um, that ring. So, you, so there's a little metal ring that you put into the piece you've carved into the stone. Um, and in order to do that, it, it's similar principles to the jump ring in the back of our last back setting, in that it's what we're giving ourselves is something with curvature over which to push the metal. Um, something that won't move. And so by making the little channel that he shows somewhere on the very bottom of page 85, by carving that channel in, what you're doing is making something that's locked into place that you can then push down around so that once it's 
enclosed, it will hold fast. But in order for that to work, this has to be a fairly tight fitting cone. Otherwise, it will just slip off of the limited amount of metal that if we've got sticking out of the stone. It makes more sense when we actually do it. <laughs> Again. Put it back on our mandrel for a moment. Tappy tappy to get it closed up. still needs more closure. Oh my goodness. This is death by a thousand saw cuts. A little bigger. We can stretch it the other way if it gets too tight. So the more I'm doing these tiny little saw cuts, the more I'm going ever so slightly out of true, which means that we have a little more filing at the end once I have it in a cap. If I didn't just lose it off of my bench entirely. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna have to get down and sweep gang. This has run away completely. Meanwhile, anybody have questions while you watch me crawl around? No, I'm just anxious to see how you're going to use a cutting disc on that stone. Yeah, that's so that's going to be an intriguing. Oh, there it is. Um, it's going to be an intriguing exercise, and how I'm going to hold the stone is the hard yeah. part. Um, what I what I'm not sure of is uh, whether I have a fine enough cutting disc. I should have checked that before today. They do come in several different thicknesses. Um, and it may have to wait for when we actually get to the setting of it. All right. I think at this point, what I need to do is solder this cone and true it because I'm not quite true and I can't tell whether the fact that I'm not fully round is what's making it feel like it doesn't fit. So I'm gonna do a soldering. I may end up needing to cut through my solder joint and get it re-soldered again once I've done that. So zoom out a little bit so you guys can get the full view. Go. As with so many of these settings, John will want us using the hard solder for it for all possible steps. So, just doing a little bit of flux. And I'm going to do um, my solder on the inside just to keep a clean joint there. Quick and easy. Oops, except for when I don't have solder cut. So I was doing a little work this week. Um, I may have mentioned on other earlier sessions that by the time we get into the prong settings portion after the first crown settings in next chapter, you may want to either have or make some small chip solder. It's a little easier when you get to the delicate prong solderings than working with wire. Um, Rio has some microscopic stuff, glitter solder basically. Um, 
but uh, there's several companies that have decent sized pre-cut chips or there's tools for cutting chips and you can always roll your own or hammer your own out of your wire solder and then cut it up into small chips, but we want tiny pieces for those projects. Not so tiny that we can't see them though. You know? Okay, cone, teeny tiny little cone. You froze. I froze? Can you hear me? Can hear yes. you. Hmm, hang on a sec. Let me see whether I can restart. Did I switch back to the bench? Yes, yes. Okay, am I moving again? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Flip in the matrix, I guess. All right, so we now have a soldered cone and I'm gonna put it back on one of my mandrels that seem to just roll away. There we go. Back on a mandrel, try to trim it up a little bit. Gotta be careful with this because I can see already that just by that amount of truing, I'm actually sort of splaying it out at the bottom. So that may be a problem. Uh, so very close though. So let me think, what tools do I have that might get me a tighter fit? If you have around uh, those pliers that might be there. Uh, that are sharp enough, they're steep enough. All my round noses are fairly small. And I need that something that's the width at the base that's the big problem. This is a little bit closer to what I need. So that's decent. I think I probably still want this a little snugger, so I am probably going to need to do a cut apart. I don't know. I don't think about that. No, I definitely think I need a snugger one. You guys give me your opinion if you can see it close enough on the Zoom cam. Well, I'm just worried that once you put that ring in there that, I don't know, somehow it's going to fit over that ring. So that's why you carve away. Um, I know, but. Yeah, you need it to be a snug, snug fit. Um, but you're right. Maybe I will leave myself a little bit more leeway than, than not for that. It's just, it feels a little loosey goosey for me. You know, I know what I can do. I can stick something down the convenient little hole and hold my stone in place. Let's see what piece of wire I have that will fit in there. I think you're frozen again. Oh, am I? Can't see me moving? No. Oh, phooey. Maybe it's not liking that camera today. Maybe I won't be able to go over there. Yeah, that's so. better. Pardon? Back? Yeah, you're back. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to find a little scrap of wire thin enough that I can thread it through so we can see how the bead cap holds. So I've got just an itty bitty amount of wiggle when I'm fully set in, but it, eh, my gut is telling me it's still a little, um, a little loose, even when I put the metal ring into place, but I could be wrong. But we'll try it at this size, not, not bother doing another round. Um, but what I now need to do is clean up the surface of the, of the piece. So we're off to sanding land with a little bit of water. Sanding land being not nearly as much fun as candy land was when we were kids. Um, so all I'm doing is getting, I'm, I'm trying to get a more consistent surface because by the time I was done with all that setting, one edge of it had sort of lifted relative to the other. So I want to make sure my height is as consistent as possible, taking down one edge 
more than the other. And I do still have a teeny tiny hole at the top, which just to me says that I cut too big a hole to begin with, but it definitely needed a bit of that to give us the ability to, to make the cone. And as with many other settings um, and, and sanding situations, don't forget the tip where you can put Sharpie marker down on your surface that you're sanding and use it as a guide to tell you when you've got everything even, because I've got one little corner of this that doesn't want to sand down consistently. So I've got this little smidge that won't get quite as low as I want it to. Still going. Oh, come on. What? I can feel it with my fingernail. It's a tiny little lip on it. I feel like there's got to be some kind of machinist tool set that has an array of angled daps that we can steal from another industry. Okay, we're good enough for government work there. All right, so now the last thing I'm going to do is put a, uh, um, so because I have the hole, I could do two things in one. Because I have a bead, so it's a, a, a single drill bead, I could make the act of putting my peg in for that bead also be what I use to make my jump ring at the top. So I think I'll probably do that. I'll pick a wire that is the right size to go into the bead. And in a perfect world, it would be square wire, or if I'm doing it like I am today, I can square up the end that I'm gonna be putting in to the um, bead end by just tapping it a bit with a hammer. To figure out, oh, I put all my hammers over to show all the tools we're going to be using for setting. Hang on, another, another one here. So all I'm doing is squaring up more than I need, just enough to give it surface area. Make sure that I don't get it so flat that it doesn't fit into the bead, which I've managed to put down. Here's the bead. Come on, yep, that may be the bead, drop it. Oh, there it is. It's been a very long work day already. A little bit disconnected right now. Okay, so this is a little too flat. Now I'm gonna just square it up a bit more on one side. Just do it. So I've got the square wire, there we go, it fits nicely. And then what I'm gonna do is twist it. Um, so I'm just gonna take some flat pliers and just twist that, that end enough that I get a spiral look to the square. So what I'm looking for is just a helix basically. And it doesn't have to be very much of the material because I'm gonna trim a fair amount of it back because it just needs to be enough to go from the cap that I put down and can't find again. Oh my God, guys, I'm sorry. Just not today. Where did the cap go? That I just finished so nicely. It may have fallen down when you lifted yeah. the sanding paper. I think you're right. I think that's what I heard go thump. There it is, perfect. Was it? I even managed to not roll over it. All right, so I'm going to need a little bit sticking into the cone. If I know that I can reach it, I can put more than I need and trim it away. If I don't think I can, I'm going to need to cut it down a little bit before I before I solder this into place. Um, in this case, I think I have way too much material. Uh, and then I'm just going to do a little bit of a jump ring at the other end. And then I'll solder that into place.
if you have not had the chance to take one of Jane Redmond's tool modification workshops, I highly recommend it. The pliers that I'm using were made in her class where you're grinding down a pair of flat rounds to give yourself extra functionality for making jump rings. And it's a game changer. And she, that's just one of the gazillions of cool things she teaches you in one of her classes. I take her classes over and over again because there's so much great info in them. So my goal at this point is to solder this ring in. I could choose to leave it open if I wanted to, or I can assume I'm going to solder a ring to it when I'm putting it into, when I'm using this device. But for now, I'm just gonna hop back over and hope that my camera doesn't freeze on me. Because it's gonna be now basically hanging, I'm gonna um, have to figure out what way is gonna hold this in position without moving the wire out of place. So I think I'm gonna set it up on top of my pliers and just make sure it's all lined up where I want. It's not quite closed enough. Am I frozen or am I still there, guys? Hello? You're still okay. here. You're yeah, fine. you're doing fine. Good, good. Right, so I'm just closing up my jump ring a little, or my loop a little bit tighter. Right, it's not a little bit tighter. Come on. There we go. And making sure that I'm still centered. Once I've done that, I've got it lined up. And this handy dandy little hole that we've got it running through will hopefully get a nice little bit of filler. Again, where possible, we're working with the hard solder. All right. Quick like bunny, get it all stuck in there. Whoa, except my solder flowed all the way down the side of my peg. <laughs> I used way too much solder, I guess. So that's going to be a problem. All right, troubleshooting time. We need to take the peg back out. Didn't think I put that much solder on there, but this might be a scrap. I bet you this is a scrap of fine silver instead of sterling, and I managed to fuse it. All right. So that is now trimmed back to where I can actually use it as a peg. I kind of mangled it. So I'll have to do a little clean up on that. All right, is that showing? We've got a little peg running down the center. Yeah. Got a little jump ring at the top. Yeah. Nice, nice fix. Little, little bell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so repairs is a, a thing that frustrated me for the first few years of my really active practice. Let me put this in the pickle and we'll chat a little bit. Uh, repairs is a good thing to use to judge your progressing skill. Um, and my, I would encourage you to never throw something away right out of the gate if you do something that screws up in your opinion screws up i put that in quotes because it's not always a screw up that you think it is try to use it as a learning exercise and problem solve sometimes that means you break a stone you figure out something else to do in setting the two halves of the stone and you come up with a cool kintsugi answer or something like that for your stone sometimes it's you've soldered something together or you've melted something so some of the exercise about recovery is how do you change that design to accommodate what you've done? 
Or is there an actual repair you can do? Can you unsolder something? Unsoldering is a really great skill to have. Um, and it takes a long time to get even the basics down because it's often a matter of you melt more than you than you save. But if you don't try, you're not you're going to get nothing out of the project you got halfway through. So consider the next time you run into a challenge like that, if you aren't already doing this, which I suspect a lot of you are, especially more students seem to be doing that via virtual because you don't have a teacher to run to in person. Um, so. I'm, I'm excited by how much more I'm seeing students teach themselves by trying. Um, but if you aren't actively trying to fix every mistake to the point of, dis of utter destruction of the project, if that's what it takes for the practice, please start doing that for yourself because it'll get you out of some tough situations down the road and suddenly you'll realize, hey, I just leveled up. I, I wouldn't have been able to do this a year ago, but now I can. Um, so that is our last basic setting, last, last basic <coughs> bezel marking, and it's going to pickle for a while, and I may make a couple more between now and next session if I can find the time. <coughs> Rachel, can we go back to the drawing? Can sure. I show you what yes. may have here? I, um, oh, you want to show me something on screen? Yeah. Hang on a sec. Let me get you screen. My mouse has to behave, and then I can get you up on screen. Hang on. Yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this, this, I think, uh, can you see? This, yes, we can see. Yep. This one is what, what you did. You first yep. measured it, and then you drew the perpendicular line. You yep. measured this one to get your arc. Okay. I got, so I used the, from the point to get my arc, yep. Right. And then you measured this distance yep. to cut this off. But you need to only measure half of that. So you, you don't need to go from here to here to get this. You have to go from the perpendicular line to this. You think it's Half only... Of it. So if you go back to... A quarter of the piece, but if we only did three halves, I think we would get... No, this you, you got this one all right. You got the full one, yep. but then you get one half here, one half here. If you go back to John's book at 84 yeah. and examine that image correct um, with magnifier you can see it or so carefully see it are we talking about what's on image four lay out lay out the pattern for a cone right so he shows only half of it uh, uh, that's my understanding I may I, be wrong. I'm not sure I agree because I'm seeing three so the he's emphasized the center so if we were to number the segments, one, two, three, three and a half, right? No, you, no, no, you get, see, this is one and this is one. So you got two. Yeah. And then you get one here and one here. If you take just the half. So you get four of them. Huh. Here you I mean, get, I guess you, it, it makes sense if you're doing four of them, because then you get the four sides. Right. Well, as you four. did it, you got six. Yeah. But I wasn't that much over when I moved down to doing just three of them. So I but think you, yeah, that's okay. This is how I understood it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we, it's worth trying. Try, <laughs> try, try your way and see if you end up short. Right. I right. feel if like you, yeah. If you look yeah. at his diagram number four, yep. And his his underlining is only one half. Okay. Of, yeah. I so it's kind of like A, B, B, C. So yeah. it, geometrically, that's what makes sense to me. Right, right, yeah. Because it's you're, if you do four of them, then you're doing the as if it were squared up. You do right. the four quadrants of the, of the right. circle. Right. Yeah, so that might get us closer, might have less wastage than the way that I did it, for sure. And the um, struggle may be less of sawing it out so many times. Yeah. Well, so the sawing it out for me was about uh, me trying to figure out what his directions were telling us versus what his drawings okay. were telling us, which seemed to me to be contradictory. But I, I see why you're going with that four. And I right. might say that that makes more sense than his right. three as yeah. interpreted across multiples. Yeah. Yeah, so good. Thank I, you. I'm an advanced math student in high school, although oh, I didn't pursue good. math. So no, that's, no, that's there you go. I will take it. I will take it. 
yeah because it's it's a i mean it's a conical is what's the what's the term for the spheres that have been made conical there's this it's, it's a cone actually it yeah. is a cone specifically yeah. so yeah. yeah um so yeah four makes sense so you're using you're dividing it down the middle do we have, let's see if there are any situations where we think that might fail us as long as our stone is a perfectly round teardrop your math should be yeah. better than uh, right if I was doing it now, I would take a little bit extra just in case. Yeah. Instead of going all the way to six, I would just extend it just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I think that your math makes more sense to me than John's description. So uh, I'll try that one next time. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, let's see. Any other questions on this one? Okay, it's making cones, and we've got lots of cones coming our way in other things that will hopefully be a little easier than this one. Um, so, so you're yeah. not going to use that separating disc and make that? <laughs> I'm going to do that as part of the setting process. Okay, okay. Because um, I need to clean this, because we, we don't want to do all of that setting until it's completely cleaned. I got to do all my filing and sanding so that it's sized right, or else I'll be putting my line at the wrong spot. Yeah, I just uh, been nervous about how to figure out how to do that. So the hard and keep part it and keeping it even. Yes, the hardest part I think is going to be how do you hold the stone in order yes. to hold it steady. Um, I I would pay dearly for an instructor that teaches you how to better hold flex shafts and things like that because I always feel like I'm not I'm not supporting my work well enough and. Um, I think Andy Cooperman may do a flex shaft class that I've, I've been wanting to take, but it feels like there's something about what do we use to grip our materials and how are we blocking ourselves from cutting it. Plus, separating discs are a challenge unto themselves, no matter what you're working on, whether it's metal or stone, um, about getting the right speed because it can't be too slow and it can't be too fast. It has to be just right. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make a couple more of these, I think, and I'm gonna try the four part part method because your math makes way more sense to me than than John's description. Um, and I'm gonna then and I'll play around with what I think are good gauges for the cutting discs before we do the setting on that one because I know I have super thick ones and super thin ones, and I think what does he suggest for a wire gauge on this? He wants us to use. One of the things that Andy Cooperman uh, does is he'll, he'll hold the handpiece upside down so it's yeah. so it's facing up, and so ah. you can work like above it and around it if you hold it against your um, your bench pin. Above it and around it. I'm trying to think how that would work with holding the stone. I think there, I can think of several projects where it's con super convenient. To well, hold if it you it, if you know where you're you're going, you could kind of probably put the separating disc at a certain level above the, uh, you know, the, the uh, bench pin and then oh. rotate that while you're holding and kind of make it a little kind of lathe type of thing. Um, so you could sort of rest your stone right at the left, like basically the way that you right. do a router and woodworking. And right. And level. then just, yeah, and turn it, maybe, I mean, I don't know, never done it. Just a, just a thought. Oh, that's, that's intriguing. I may have to do some some practicing and playing between now and our setting of that stone because that has a lot of potential. And I brought I bought plenty of extras of this stone because I've never set it before. And I saw that section, Wendy, and said, "Oh my goodness, I have to carve into the stone. I better get some practice stones." So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I've got some work ahead of me between variations on the cone, and I also want to try. Like I want to see what it's what I need to think about when I'm doing a pattern sheet version of this. If I want to do any of those decorative elements, I think there's a lot of potential to this setting, and I just want to do it with larger stones because my God, this is fiddly to get these angles. So yeah, let's see what that looks like once it's cleaned up. Oop, did somebody uh, love this chart? Which chart, Helen, are you talking about? One of all the settings that you showed at the beginning. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I every time you that. pull it out, I love it. 
So. Oh yeah. It's my sampler. Didn't, didn't all of you make samplers when you were learning how to sew when you were kids? I did. I know I got to do my, my stitchery sampler when I was younger. It's a little outdated these days, I guess. Um, okay. So we have now attempted all the conceivable settings in bezel section. There's a few um, shapes of stones that we didn't cover. Somebody put in a request that at some point I do a trillion setting. Are there any others that I missed that people really wanted me to attempt um, besides having to go back and I, I may go back and on screen do the um, emerald cut again, just because that was so traumatic and I need to do it better than that. I'm just not convinced that John's methods are the way that I'll end up doing it by the time I'm done. Um, any other things that I should be putting on my do it once we get past some setting? Trilli we got a, a vote for Trillium. Um, any others out there that, you, that I missed? Yes, Wendy, what do you got? No, I was voting for the Trillium too. Oh, yeah. Always, but got definitely it. we do that emerald, that would yes. really help. Yeah, it will help me too a lot if I redo it. Um, yeah, and Trillium is nothing we need to uh, force me to do. It's my favorite cut of stone, I think, in a faceted stone. Um, I can potentially do at some point after we've gotten stuff, I could do, I've got some really unusual cuts that are like combinations of, there's inner curves and outer curves and angles all in the same stone. And I don't know why I bought them because I was crazy, but they're fun to play around with. I've managed to set one of that particular convex concave combo. Um, but if you guys think of anything along the course of this, let me know and we'll maybe have a play day in midsummer or something like that. Okay, ready to talk setting gang? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna move us over to my other cam altogether. And I'm hoping you'll be able to hear me because I'm gonna be over at my far bench showing tools again as a refresher. We're going to talk a little bit about the array of tools that we're about to start playing around with. So we have the, the materials that we're going to be using to set material, set to set in something to hold our stones, which is going to be particularly important because my stones are all freestanding right now. They aren't on something larger that I can hold down. So I'm trying the Jet Ballistic, um, which there's multiple versions of Jet. Jet Ballistic is the one that's made with Kevlar, like from Kevlar Vests. And most people who like the Jet Sets tend to recommend this version. Um, it also melts a lot quicker, but if you want something that's not as outrageously expensive in your local Michaels or whatever, there are um, pla friendly plastic versions. There's a bunch of different brand names of this. I'll warn you that this tends to require hotter water to get to mold than the Jet Ballistic does, um, but it's way cheaper, like $40 cheaper for the quantities that you get. Um, and it, you're just going to need boiling water and you'll want to use tools and not put your hand in with it. So it's a little harder to get placed where you want. We are also working with with shellac because I've always wanted to try this. John talks about it and I've never actually seen a setter other than John do a lot of talking about it. It feels a little bit uh, old world and that the ballistics of the world have taken it over. So as a reminder, he tells us when we're using the flake shellac, we've got to put a little bit of plaster of Paris powder in with it. And then we're going to make a little tool to do that with. If you haven't seen shellac flake. It's really literally flakes that look like somebody chipped paint off of something because it is chips of paint, chips of shellac. So we're going to use those and on both sticks and locks to hold things in place. Um, for a, a treat to myself that I've been waiting for because I didn't want to spend the money on a full scale GRS, I got a cheapo version of a setting or graving block. So you'll see, I, and I fell in love with it the instant I started using it. Um, so I may be looking to buy one of the uh, full scale GRSs for my birthday. But this little cheapo set was 90 bucks compared to GRSs, what, 300 or something? Um, and it comes with some additional installation devices that can hold things different ways. Some of them have rubberized 
uh, fronts to them and so on. So we'll play around with those and see what works to hold materials. Uh, those are the majority of the ways we're going to grip things other than with our hands. Um, you'll notice that I've got a, my, a scrap of leather to add into my piece because it does have some somewhat harsh corners and particularly if you're say setting a ring or something to have a little bit of a divider. You could also use a piece of rubber matting or something like that. I just happen to have leather scraps handy. Um, and I really like that this has every possible pivot direction so you're not straining and moving your hands around as much. I'm going to show you the old school, I don't have these tools way, and then I'm going to show you how much it improves having something that's that mobile. Rachel, who yeah. makes that set? This one I'm going to have to get, it was an Amazon like overseas special. I'll have to get you guys the link. Um, it's definitely not as precision oriented as the GRS system, nor is it as large. So it's got a limitation on the size that it can hold for material. But I will get that link and post it in the Facebook group. And or if people don't have Facebook, I can post it next session um, if you guys remind me. Um, then we're going to use a bunch of different hand tools. So there's some of the basics. We have a setting punch series, which is really only good for round settings. And when it's good for them, it's really good for them. So this is an easy, fast, doesn't muck up your hands as much as hand uh, manipulating things does, or as, as using um, pushers and things like that does for basic round settings. It's great for faceted stones, a little less so for calves. It depends on the height of the calf, but it's really designed to just pop round diamonds and other small stones into place quickly. Um, we are going to be using at some point, but maybe not on this round of setting, um, I got a beading tool, which is for adding detailing around it. Um, and it's a itty bitty set of little devices that put cool little marks little lumps of faux beading around your setting. Um, John is a big proponent of having good gravers on hand. Again, that's for doing what's called bright cutting around your bezel settings to give that final clean, crisp look after you've set everything down. So we'll do a little bit with that. Then we move on to a lot of basic hand tools in this world. Um, and I'm gonna do a little bit more tool prep as part of this. So here is a pretty traditional, uh, this is probably Rio or Auto Fry that I bought it at, but a traditional bezel pusher. I have one that I got for the sake of modifying for you guys um, because it's a different size for one, but also any bezel pusher that you buy is gonna come with kind of sharp, harsh edges. So you're gonna to wanna to prep this by doing a little file down and, um, and polishing. And then one thing that John, uh, reading through book, John's book taught me is that I thought you wanted these as a, at an absolute pristine polish, but John doesn't actually recommend that. He recommends that once you've got a pristine polish, you take a coarse bastard file or something that you don't care much about and bump it across the surface ever so slightly just to give enough roughness that it will hold without slipping. So if you're like me and you've had all of yours high polished, consider touching one up and seeing how much easier it is to keep from slipping across your stone. One of the most common problems is we're pushing really hard and whack, we slide and scratch the stone. Um, so that little bit of bumping of texture on it does a nice job of helping support that. Um, we also have the ones that we made from the nails in an earlier session. And I've got one thicker one and one that's a little more angular. Uh, but the nice thing about these is you can make as many of them in as many different types as you want. Um, I got brass rod. I just haven't set it into one of my handles. But that gives you different material. A lot of people prefer setting with brass over steel. So I'm going to play around with the variances and tell you guys what I'm sensing about how they differ. Um, I also just this past weekend was generously gifted by uh, Chris Anderson of Lion Punch Forge. He makes these amazing found object punches and uh, or um, uh, pushers rather, and then uh, horn-based burnishers. So I'm going to have fun playing around with those. That's Chris Anderson at Lion Punch Forge. 
Um, and these look like way, way more fun to work with than everyday tools. Um, there, when we get to prong setting, there's a prong pusher that's a little bit different than a bezel pusher. I don't know if you guys can see, but it has a little notch in it. Um, you could easily make yourself one of these, and it's just to give you support on either side of the prong as you're pushing it up. This particular uh, setting is a little bit long for me, and this is something you should consider because it may be impacting your ability to set. A good uh, position for setting, which is my traditional one, so a good position for setting is that your fingers are almost at the front end of it when you've got it solidly in the palm of your hand. This is gonna be true when we get to gravers too, because you're, you're, most people, they have like, this is too, way too long by about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch for me. So it may be that it, if you got a fresh out of the box one, check depending on your hand size, you may need to cut a piece off of it and reform it at the, at the end to give yourself a better setting tool. Uh, then we have my personal favorite, those uh, not flooring nails, but what did I say they were? Because I had it done wrong. Uh, masonry nails. I use this to set more of my personal style jewelry than just about any other tool because what I've been able to do is grind it down to a very fine angular spot. And I do, uh, I work with Druzy's a lot. And so I particularly like a textured bezel that emulates a little bit of that roughness of the Druzy. So I do a hammer texture finish around several of my collections settings. Um, but you could also, you know, make dots. You could make all kinds of different shapes because you can make your own tools and that's cool. The hammer, uh, the, the nails in particular, I do, I do these as hammer setting, which I'm gonna show you using either a tiny goldsmith's hammer or a riveting hammer or something with a, you don't care too much about its surface because you're gonna be banging it up against um, the steel tools. Um, and that's just a tap, tap, tap. Uh, Rachel? Yeah. So I've um, been to Home Depot in Rona to try to find nails to make yeah. tools out of. Yeah. And I always have a problem figuring out what kind to buy. So the ones that I have aren't shaped in that taper. They're like the traditional round ones. So, so I, you can use the round ones and then just flatten. But this was the, if you, if you were in one of my early sessions and I talked about these and then I, uh, then the next session I gave a correction, I had been calling them flooring nails because it had been so long since I bought them. You're looking for masonry nails. So they may not be with all the other nails. Oh, yeah. okay. And they, they do come in several widths. So there's this narrow one and then there's a version that's like maybe half an inch wide at the top and then tapers down more dramatically and the length determines how tapered they are. Hmm. Yeah, so yeah, my apologies you. If, you, if you didn't get the, the correction on that one. Um, but yeah, those are, I buy those by the box just because, but then I have a box of them for a long time. And that's so why I didn't remember. So um, by, the, by the narrow masonry nails, just, narrow. just that kind or all of the kinds? So the masonry nails, as long as it's this shape, that boxy one, I'll put a link up again because I did dig that up when I realized I had given you guys the, the wrong term for it. Um, I'll put that, I'll post that again, but it's also in the Facebook group in the resources area now. Okay. Um, but the, I use both widths of it, both the narrow and the wide ones. What I'm looking for though, is I really like the square ones. And what you don't want is galvanized. I don't think they make masonry nails galvanized, but you're going to be grinding and playing with these. You don't want the galvanic stuff coming off on you. This is just a straight up steel nail. Um, let's see, what else did I miss on here? Oh, so bezel rockers. I have a love-hate relationship with bezel rockers. I was taught to use them as my primary setting tool early on, but I was taught to use them the wrong way. I was taught to use them up down. And bezel rockers are truly mostly designed for a left right along the wall of it. And that was a game changer for me when literally 20 something years into my metalsmithing career, somebody showed me the right way to use it. I still am not a huge fan because they tend to slip a lot. And then Chris Plouffe, when I was taking a class with me, explained that he too had a love-hate relationship with them until he made a very cool modification to it. 
I don't know if it's showing well enough, but what he does is he grinds a little edge halfway across the plate. And what that does is it lets you rest it on the top of your bezel wall and control the rock, right? So I'm gonna show that one close up when we start to use it, but that alone, like I don't ever use this one ever. I only use this one and then only as a touch up setting to get the last of my push down along the top edge of a stone because now I have that cool lip added to it. So don't be afraid to mod your tools. Um, in this one, I also added some of the tape grip stuff that helps that, that some people use it when they're polishing and so on. I don't like having things on my hands when I'm polishing because it means they can get caught and drag my hands in, but it's great for adding temporary grips if you need a little bit more control. Uh, this tool is ever so slightly short for me. Um, I think they're all they, so the only size that I've seen them really come in, so I haven't been able to, unless I take it apart and build my own handle, I'm not going to be able to get a good mod on that. But I also don't use it a whole lot. Those are the hand tools that I've got gathered for us. If there are others that you have played around with that you really like, we can talk about those too. I will also at some point bring out my uh, hammer hand piece, which I have for a micro motor, which is a little bit different than what you have, what you use when you are, um, when you're using it on a Fordham. Uh, hang on a sec, my screen is telling me that I need to log back in. Uh, do, do, do. Okay. Rachel? Yep. What, uh, <clears throat> what uh, shape and size of gravers do you suggest? So John had the listed set that he thinks everybody should have early in chapter two, I want to say. I never remember the numbers without referencing his book. Let me see if I can find it for you. I have them. Do you? Yeah, because I bought them and I still need to file them. Um, number uh, we're going to do in, in, a, in a later session when we're doing graver settings, we're going to actually follow his directions for cutting those down. Um, it's just if you want one beforehand for doing your break cuts that you'll want to try and follow the directions on your own first. Um, okay. So yeah, the number is chapter, chapter two. There's a 52. And a 42. And a 42. And there, I thought there were three that he recommended. Um, let me see the other one. Anglet, a flat, and a something. There we go, Gravers. Page 19. Um, he has flat, round, knife, and anglet, but he recommends that we all have... Maybe he doesn't list it there. Maybe it's later on. It might I be have, Sorry, but I have the, the, you call it like, it was like a hinge file? Chenier, yeah, really that's really the hinge. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, yeah, separate. That's, that we use uh, in a couple of, uh, of our small detailed filings for settings. Like when we get to the crown setting, that's super handy. Um, so... We can dig up the numbers on the gravers. I feel like there's a third one besides the 42 and the 52 that he recommends. Um, the one that we're using for uh, doing the bright cut is a flat, I believe. So uh, any other questions on those tools that I zipped us through? Okay, now comes the which stone do we wanna set first? And you're not allowed to say the one we just finished because I still need to clean it up. So we have a lot of choices and we can work basically left to right, which will give us some practice on the um, basic settings before we get some of the fancier ones. So I think we maybe start with a good basic one, which is a round setting in uh, this was, what was this, 22 gauge wall with a 22 gauge back plate, although we cut it away. So let's start on that. And we're gonna go from challenging holding positions and so on to actually putting it in material. So I'm gonna pick, they're my favorite setting tools for this basic. 
have the basics. Rachel, page 134 for the gravers. Oh, thank you. Thank you for finding that. Good, good. So Betsy, there you go. You can... And on like, what, Betsy? Um, yeah. What did you say? I didn't say anything. Oh. <laughs> All right. So one of our most common, oops, sorry, I'm jiggling on you guys. One of our most common things to do is set while just holding it in our hands. I'm sure we've all done that, either on a project or independent of the other things. It might just be there's a pendant bail on there or what have you. So I'm going to start with this. The heavier gauge metal you have, the less likely that is to work well. But it's good enough for us to talk about the basics of any stone setting we do. I'm going to put this on a piece of paper first so you can see it, which is that um, you're going to use the uh, compass points to do your starting process. So we're going to do a north, south, east, west. And we'll talk about corners and John's opinion that is contrary to much of the popular thinking on cornering when we get to a stone with corners. But for now, we're going to assume that we've got ordinal points, cardinal points, ordinal point, whatever the north, south, east, west is. So we're going to start by doing our push in along those. And then we're going to work our way in between on the angles, on the northeast, southeast, etc. And then we'll have a really ugly mess. And what I remind people of is that stone setting in particular looks terrible before it looks good again. It's going to look great when you're in the state and then you'll start setting and it'll look horrible and it'll get better and better and better. Um, so don't get frustrated if it starts to look wonky. But the reasoning behind doing the opposite sides, working regularly from side to side, is that if you don't, you may squish your stone up at, a, at an angle and it'll start to lift on one side, right? So we need to give it push and counter push in everything we do. And we need a fairly good amount of pressure. If you're using a fragile stone like an opal or something, you have to be extra careful of this. But my action here is pushing in and up at an angle, but not all the way up yet. We're still in the compass phase. So when I'm using, when I'm holding my hands, uh, holding this in my hands, I have to move it around. And all I'm doing is that tiny little divot in, in and push, in and push. And I'm not going way crazy. And I personally, oh, you guys can't see me when I'm doing this. I hold my um, elbow tucked tight into my rib cage when I'm doing it. So what I'm moving is a small amount of hand action up and down with the movement. So I've now done north, south, east, west. I'm going to go to the diagonals and I'm going to push up and push up. And let me actually draw, I wish somebody had drawn this kind of thing for me when I was starting, but let me draw some of the good and bad scenarios I've seen. So we have a bezel wall on our stone here, and we have a stone that comes up in some way inside of the bezel cup, right? You do not want your bezel pusher up here. You want your bezel pusher starting down here and pushing, the, the, what you're doing is you're pushing in. So you're trying to first fill this gap before you go up and fill this gap. Right? We're doing this in stages. So if you start up here, if, if you start right at the top of your wall, what you're going to get is a wall that gaps out, leaving pockets in here. And it's going to be much harder to compress your metal. Right. So first think about in against the, against the stone. And then in a later phase, we're going to work the wall down. So it's in and then down. One and then two, right? It may take more than one or two rounds, depending on the gauge. Because um, our goal is truly to have our walls be pressed up following the curvature of the stone when we're done. So that's one challenge I've seen. Um, the other challenge is that I've seen people go all the way up so that they're upright with their, with their pusher right out of the gate. There are phases of certain kinds of settings where you're going to need to get an almost upright push. But again, if you do it out of the gate, 
think about the pressure. You're going to try to be compacting this downward instead of inward. So really imagine when you're setting about that air pocket between the wall and not making it gap, but instead working it in until it actually follows the stone. So conscious thought as you're moving any tools you're using, whether it's a bezel pusher, whether it's hammer set, you want to think about the pu pushing together. So even when I'm doing a hammer set finish, I've done the push in from the sides first. All right, so back to our, our diagonals to get us our lumpy bumpy all the way around. And again, I'm pushing in and, did I miss a corner? I missed a corner. Um, in and up a little bit, but not in and way up. All right, so now I've got my eight positions and I'm starting to get this wavery line. This is usually where my intro students start panicking because it looks terrible, but they don't know how much more worse it's going to, how much worse it's going to look before it looks good. Now I start working on my largest lumps that are still sticking out and their opposites, even if their opposite doesn't stick out as much. Because again, if I put too much pressure on one side versus the other, I'm going to end up pushing the stone up the bezel cup a ways. So I'm always looking for the opposite sides while I'm in this phase of things. So I look for a lump and then I look for the opposite side, even if its lump isn't really there. I look for a lump and I work the opposite side. Lump, opposite side. You're going to do that until you don't really have lumps left, which is going to take a lot longer than you think. Especially if you're working with a heavy bezel. Okay, so you're going until what you're watching for is, do you have gapping still left? And if you have gapping, that's considered a lump. Oops, I didn't do my opposite on that one. Bad. All right, so I'm getting down to the point where I'm not really finding lumpy lumps. I'm just finding a little further away from the stone than the other side. And so now we're sort of in the place where it's, we can start just working the spots that need a little bit more help. So I'm, I've, I've set it enough that I'm less worried that I'm gonna push it out of its bezel. But even so, I may flip to the other side every once in a while if I'm doing a lot on one side, just to make sure I'm staying fairly equal pressure. And now I'm starting to work my way a little bit higher up than when I first did my pushes in, because now my goal is to start getting the top of the lip pushed a little closer to the stone. And this is one of those places where there are people who will only set stones if they have magnifying glasses or if they have a microscope set. It's a good habit to get into. Oh, see, then we get slide. You need to get a little more texture on there. Um, if you find yourself slipping a lot and, and find yourself scraping your stones, don't hesitate to put some painter's tape. Just trim it close and put it over your stone. Not a big deal. Um, I want you guys to be able to see what I'm doing a little bit more than that. Um, so again, I'm looking for places where like, I could see a slight fingernails gap. I'm just pushing away. And as I work my way to the top, as I hit the curvature, I'm going a little higher up with each pass to get it closer to the edge. So I'm not so much concerned about coming in from the side now as I am now working the upper wall. And um, consider the stone that you're setting. Again, opals being one of my favorites, but one that I, I break about one out of every three opals I set these days because um, they're so fragile and I'm aggressive with my setting technique uh, and need to chill out a little bit more when I do opals. But especially I like to set them in gold, which is even harder to set than silver. Um, so that impacts it as well. But so, like malachite is another ugly one because it has those striations in it. And if you hit it just wrong, your pressure is going to crack open one of the seam lines, one of the, you know, layers of the malachite 
Um, some stones are more fractious on a corner than they are, you know, a diamond can be chipped on its edge or something. Uh, it doesn't, just because it's a sturdy stone doesn't mean it's unbreakable. Um, and heavy action, like when you're hammer setting, it takes a while to get used to not over hitting the stone and to listen to the way that the um, sound of the blow responds so that you know that you're not actually hitting the stone so much as you are the metal. Um, so when we get to that, you'll hopefully be able to hear the difference. And I'll make sure I have a cheap stone that I can intentionally hit too hard. So I'm getting to the point where if this were set in something, I would probably be picking it up and working it either more with this um, if I found specific spots, or I've got it close enough that I will probably move from here to a burnisher, which is the other tool I forgot to mention while I was over there. Let me grab it. Where's my burnisher? And you're going to have to forgive me. This burnisher has seen better days, and I really need to get one that I can polish up. Um, so I would move to a burnisher. Burnishers can cut you. They are sharper than they appear. They don't have a sharp, sharp edge or if they do, you should be blunting them. But I've stabbed myself when I slipped with a burnisher um, and those, those ends are pretty spiky. There are also a few different sizes and curvatures of them. I personally am a fan of the ones with a slight curve. I find I can control my scrape better than I can with a sharp spiky one. You know, I don't like the straight as much, but your mileage may vary and different ones will work better for certain tools, for certain settings. So um, if you haven't, make sure it's a fairly well polished edge. And the thing to think about is a peeling potatoes method. If you are holding a carrot peeler or a potato peeler in your hands, the action that you're taking is across the stone and you're pulling it towards your thumb. So what I want you to notice is that I've got things supported. I don't have them quite as supported as I would because I'm trying to stay out of my your line of sight um, on the camera, but I've got my arms braced, my hands braced, and this is the most important thing in doing my burnishing support, is I'm pulling towards, I'm using a, an action of my thumb doesn't move, but my four fingers are giving me this squeeze motion to draw across the top edge of the metal, okay? So it's peel, peel, peel. And, um, this is going to make it less likely that you're going to slide across and slice yourself. Um, so this is what I've found to be the most durable and supportive. It's going to be hard on your hands. It's going to put a lot of tension on your thumb. But by bracing the whole piece, whether it's a, on a pendant or standalone like this one is, what you're doing is controlling and limiting your movement so you're not going crazy with how much you move. You're also working upright. One of the biggest scratch challenges is if somebody's trying to get in and they work down on their piece and there's a back plate here, they're scratching the heck out of their back plate, right? So those are two actions that I find students do a lot, but sometimes you have no choice but to get into a crevice or corner and get something polished out. You have to be upside down. Again, if this were on a big sheet, let's call this a sheet of matte metal for my pendant, my stunning little pendant I've got here, and I needed to get into a small space, I would probably put painter's tape down so that at the very least, instead of scratching the heck out of the metal, I'd at least realize I was scraping the painter's tape as it tried to peel up. But give yourself whatever protection you need, painter's tape or packing tape or what have you. Um, by the time you're at using the burnisher, there should be no movement in your stone, right? So if I were to shake it and I've got a little bit of movement, so I need to do some work on this. Or if I listen, this is one of the things that I do is I listen close to my ear. If I can hear any clicking or little movements, it's not snug enough. And because this one has slight movement, in it, I'm gonna put down my burnisher in favor of doing a little more pushing because it means I did not get something in as snugly as, I, as it appeared to me. So I'm gonna work on that side on pushing again to try to lock it in place a little better. And then I'll come back around and do another pass over the top to push down the upper edge because that's part of what keeps it snug until I don't have that rattle. Because if there's rattle, it means there's room for over time, 
the stone to open up the bezel. It'll move a little bit and it'll shift the metal out of the way over time. Um, and so that's what creates scenarios that have lost stones. Um, but if it's not rattling, still a little bit of rattle. Um, if it's not rattling, it's less likely to move and shift the metal underneath uh, around it. Get rid of the rattle. No, still a rattle. There's still a rattle. So I'm going to go from the top down and see if that's what's keeping it not locked in. So again, still small, quick movements with, while still being controlled. So I'm doing a fairly heavy push. I'm keeping my, let me see if I can show you guys on screen, my switch screens. So when I say I'm, oh, that didn't switch, hang on. Come on. So when I say that I'm tucked in, I mean, I'm right in elbow into the rib cage. So when I'm doing these movements that you're seeing on screen, there's no movement happening out of my elbow. It's all at the wrist. So if you've got a lot of stones to set, give yourselves breaks, stretch, counter stretch. Um, but that gives you support and you should be seated in such a way that you're not going to say roll away uh, from your bench. You know, that you're putting pressure against whatever you're doing. So make sure that you're in snugly and really working it. If you're, if you're chicken winging it, you're more likely to slide across the stone because your arm is flapping around and, and it loses the control of pushing down. And the good news about this kind of setting is that it's additive, meaning we learn more about each of our subsequent settings because they all start with this same base on the on the bezels, this kind of push. Sometimes we're going to have to angle our stones differently. Sometimes we're going to have to have them held in certain materials in order to get to the places that we need to push. But overall, once you're good at the base, well, still got a bit of rattle. Um, then you will you'll have techniques that work for your other settings as well. We just have a few extra tricks that we have to add to the mix when we get to corners and unusual shapes. Questions about any of what I'm doing? Or anything radically different than you that you've learned? No. Good. For me, for me, when I put the bezel in, I, I didn't realize that you had to start from the bottom up. I've, I knew north, south, west, east and west, that type of situation. Yeah. You start on opposite sides, but I never, I didn't know that. <laughs> Let's just say. Oh. So that the, the, the answer on that one is that you might be able to set your stone successfully without starting there, but it's going to be a lot more work because you're having to then later stages of it, you're having to compact down and in at once. Yes. Whereas if you do it, what I've described, you're, you're working your way, like it's like building a pot in a, on a ceramic wheel. We're working our way up mm -hmm. to the top and putting it in a, a piece at a time. And I think that's why I got always got such bumpy, crummy tops on my bezels because I was pushing down rather than in. And in, yeah. Um, so the bumpy, crum crummy tops are, are recoverable. Um, and and if at some point you guys want me to do one as if I were starting out, I guess, which does, I don't mean that to sound insulting, but some of the I can create some of the problems on the setting and how show how I would recover from them. Because bumpy top is what I mean when I say it's going to get ugly before it gets pretty. Mine was mm -hmm. fairly neat ugly because I've done enough of these that my north, south, east, west, etc. are pretty consistent. But bumpy ugly usually happens from inconsistent pushing in the either the directions or the like you push more on one side of it than the other. And so you get wobbly. 
but it's recoverable because then it's, again, find the biggest bump and work that one and then push the other side, find the next biggest bump and work it. So don't, don't be, in fact, if you have stones that you feel are still bumpy, go back and try a little bit more push because it is recoverable. Yeah, it's, it's been a challenge. I mean, I literally, I have um, like a baker's table that I use as my tabletop, like from nice. someone's kitchen. Yeah. And um, I usually, I take the ring or the bezel and I push it against it. I find that to help me just to push it against the wood because the wood isn't going anywhere. Right. That's a great call out. Modify your tools. I think at one point John talks about when we do prong setting, he puts a little notch here like I've got right there so that he has something to push. I probably would need to put one on this side because I'm right-handed, but you put, put something here that supports the notch that the prong is on that side. And then it will give you it feedback. Basically, that's what we're doing when we do this North, South, East, West, and then continuing to do opposites is we're pushing one side and balancing it by using that wood table, the way you're describing or your bench block you're giving a counter push so it's less likely to start tipping as you're setting it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our, our tools are, if we think about what the tool is supposed to accomplish instead of just accepting that it's a, I don't, uh, accepting that it's a tool that does a thing, instead think about how and why it does that thing, you may be able to sort of analyze what's different about how you can hold it or how you can improve its function. Like that, that modification that Chris does, that's such a simple thing. Right. To just change that lip. And now I've got something that rests where I want to still giving me my rocker capability. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to try to do that because yeah, I was always like, I would put it on and it would slip on me or, yep. and then I would get to the point where I would get started with that and then finish with the, the wood because I was pushing against it. And then sometimes I just literally used like a riveting hammer mm -hmm. just to get the top smooth because even all of that, and then I was really pushing. And then it was like, if I hammer this too hard, I'm <laughs> So were you using a riveting hammer directly on your metal? Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to love hammer setting then because that's the, when you, when you find that, when you feel like you need to take a hammer to your piece, mm -hmm. the benefit of using a nail or some other tool be between it is that it gives you much more precision in your control. When you're hitting with an actual hammer, you can't focus the landing of the blow. So you're more likely to chip your stone. But if you've got a tool that you've, hand positioned where you want, got it in place, and then tap that, the transmission of the energy is directly to the place that you've landed it. So that's hammer the one settings. you apply? I'm sorry, Pardon? is that the one you, you connect to Rio? I mean, is that the one from Rio that you connect to your Fordham? Oh, I don't mean a, sorry, I don't mean the hammer hand piece. I mean, when you're doing hammer setting, where you're taking a hammer and like that nail that I showed you that I modified, I okay. position that and I tap it with the top of the nail with a hammer. That's mm. hammer setting. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the equivalent when you're doing it mechanically is in fact the hammer hand piece. Um, but I'll show you, I'll, we'll see the differences in how those work. Hammer hand piece is when you're doing so many that you really need something to save your muscles and, and, and their, or their thick bezels. And so you don't have the power behind your push to do this. Right, so I got rid of my rattle. Oops, still wants to be slippery though. I'm gonna go back to using the carrot peeler method. Just wanna check time, seven o'clock, okay. So um, again, the burnishing is taking that last little bit of the lip down mm -hmm. and flattening it. It's kind of angling it. Let me draw that one for you. So I've got, when I'm finished with my push, what I've got is this following the stone, right? When I'm burnishing, what I'm doing is I'm blunting that down and starting to make it more flattened up against so it starts to follow the line. This could also be done with a bright cut, but that what a bright cut does is the opposite. It emphasizes that inside angle 
shining it up, right? But burnishing, unlike bright cutting, burnishing also does the added uh, act of pushing the last bits of metal of those lumpy bumpies down smooth against the material, against the stone. So I normally would, you know, this is a little bit awkward because I'm doing literally just the stone. I'd normally have a piece to grip onto, but I find that I have a much easier time controlling my um, burnishing when I can hold the piece in my hands and then support, support, whatever I can do to keep it controlled. But in, in all times, my burnishing is peeling towards my solidly placed thumb. Most The majority of my strength goes into the thumb push. And then this is just a drag action with a push downward against the metal. And I want to make clear that I am scraping the metal, not the stone. That's very important. So I'm pushing the upper lip of the um, bezel up, down. And if I were to magnify it for you, you would see that it's running on the metal only. And there's a tiny like fingernails width gap between the bezel, uh, between the uh, burnisher and the stone itself. And so what you'll see if you're doing this right is that you start to get a nice shiny layer along that top wall and all those extra little lumpy bumpies start to go away. So let me just take a peek at this and see how we're looking. So I'm feeling pretty solid about this. I usually run a fingernail around it to make sure I'm not finding any gaps that I'm not seeing. But again, looking under a microscope would be even better. I don't have a means to ma magnify my microscope for the cameras. And I frankly don't use it terribly often because I have pretty good up close vision. So that I would say is a fairly set stone. It's not a fairly finished stone because what I would do after this, if I wanted a super clean look is I would take a um, Swifty wheel is my favorite, um, which is a rubberized wheel of a specific brand. And I would be running it around the edge. Um, I like Swifties because they don't damage stones um, while still giving a really good final push down and burnish. They are a disposable. If I run it against this, it's going to spew off bits of the rubber because it's catching a little bit on the bits of the stone. Um, but it'll also do things like polish up any um, solder spots you've got and so on. So I can do a little of that and then we can do our night's um, uh, show and tell, or I can just show you that when we have a few of these and we would do a batch of them together to show them finished. Any preferences, strong preferences? Well, I have a question about that part there. I sure. mean, you can use, you can use, like you said, the rubber wheel and it'll take the scratches out and make it look good. Yep. But I see so many times that I've seen it on YouTube or just in general where they slice, they take the engraver and they slice the whole top. That's called bright cutting. And that's, so I would, I would probably not have burnished it quite so far down if I were bright cutting. So that's, what we run, uh, let me draw that because this is way too small of a stone for you guys to see what's going to happen with that. So, um, and it, that is a, especially on high-end jewelry, gold jewelry, mm -hmm. platinum jewelry, that is a very, very special common finish. Um, so what we've got is... Our setting is basically switch, switch like, cameras. oh, thank you. Sorry. Redraw that. So we've got our setting that we have now pushed down to follow the stone. Right? Rachel, it didn't switch. Oh, shoot. Come on, cameras. Technology, man. So we've got our setting following our stone, right? Whether it's a faceted stone or a cab, it doesn't matter, but it's been pushed down so that it's now closely affiliated with the wall, right? Um, we've done a little bit of burnishing in this case, which sort of pushes down the last of this, but doesn't entirely get rid of it. And on a thin bezel, because we're only using a 22 gauge for this one, there's not a whole lot of material here. But when you do a bright cut, what you're doing is you're running, let's see if I can draw this, basically that graver is running right along this line and it creates 
a super polished surface running all the way around. So then it fades out into the rest of your bezel down the side here. So what we get, let's see if I can represent this with another color, is this, this plane would be highly polished by the graver cut. Okay. And that absolutely that takes it down. It, it shaves finely the little bits of lumps that you have left that the naked eye might not see, but when they're gone, it really looks shiny. And it gives us basically a ring of material. That's our regular bezel. And it's got this line right at the stone wall that's extra bright because of the graver cut. So that's bright cutting is what you're describing seeing. Um, and John talks a little bit in this about the angles uh, that you need to hit for that. And I always have a hard time with them. So we're gonna have some fun when we get to that stage of things. Um, mm. And you're not gonna do that holding it in your hand the way that I've been doing the rest of this setting, right? So we're gonna get the graver ball out for that uh, and, and do some careful bright cutting and the graver ball is extra useful because then you can spin as you push and graver i really want to take a good graver class and there's a few great ones out there but the the gist of graving carefully and well is that you're not putting a lot of force behind it it's about the angle you hit it's about having a highly sharpened graver and and then getting it so that you're basically Think of it as like when you're trying to, if you're like me and you like your cheese sliced extra thin, it's about how do you get the barest little bit off at a time when you're graving. So you're not trying to gouge deeply. Um, but yes, we will do some of those on some of the, I, I will do grave, I will do that kind of setting on some of the thicker walled bezels because that's where it really shows. On this tiny little 22 gauge, it's not going to do a heck of a lot to improve the visual impact of the stone setting. So, okay, all right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's, it just looks so good. And I was it wondering. It looks great when they do it. Yeah. Um, and it takes patience. It takes a lot of patience. I'm not very good at it. So I need more practice. I'm happy to do that on screen, making an absolute fool of myself, but hopefully not sliding into my hands and cutting myself. So um, any other questions about tonight? Uh, we will go through a lot more stone setting on the next session because it'll be all setting all the time. I have a question about the, you said the, the shellac. Yep. That's going to be for, for the stone to hold the stone. So it's not to hold the stone into the setting so much as it to, is to hold the setting, the setting in place. So then I, like I did that one on a big brick, or if you've got just a single stone, you can put it on the end of a wooden dowel or something. You then put that in your vice, in your actual vice, not the setting ball vice. Um, uh, yeah, shellac is a dot for stones, basically. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just a hold it there. I suspect that, um, you may want to wait until you see me use it in comparison to jet ballistic. It is way messier than jet ballistic and, and it has a smell and you have to make sure that you're heating it carefully. Like I cheated and tried to heat it with my torch, which is not a good call because it, burns much more quickly than you would want. But like if you have uh, um, a heat gun or I brought it out special, I hadn't had to go find it because I haven't, I haven't done wax working in a long time. Um, an alcohol burner is what John recommends for it. Um, but of course I have no matches because I never light anything but my torch. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we will, we will use sure. that. Yeah, I just we'll want to make sure that. I have the tools because I do Absolutely. have the the cool tools jet oh yeah cool tool is just another variant of jet ballistic um i think what i'm finding is that jet, jet ballistic is easy to melt and position the cool tool and the equivalent the white balls that i saw that i showed earlier friendly plastic take a little more heat so it's all about can you hold it in place the shellac you have to do a lot more cleanup afterwards whereas the jet ballistic you just reheat so it's a little healthier and easier to clear out of things um, i'm trying it purely because john says it's one of the tools he's used and so i wanted to experiment with it but i've never owned it until this book project so we'll see what happens all right thank you any other questions out there okay who's got stuff to show Anyone? 
what you've been working on. Come on, people. I have help, help. something. Something. What do you got? Um, well, I have this piece here. Yeah. And that was like, um, I wanted it to be like burst. And um, I wanted to use the bullet going the back setting. It. Fantastic idea for that. Yeah. So that was something I was sort of working today. Um, yep. And then I was also thinking about doing another one with the crystal yep. and the bullet. So the crystal from set from the back? Oh, you're trying to double set it. Oh, neat. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't even talk about the idea of using the double setting as, as two different materials. That's great. You're going to have a little bit of a challenge because you have two different facet shapes, basically. Right. But you might be able to help yourself on that by creating a small inset wall for the crystalline shape, like that fills it. It's just you're going to have to see what that looks like for how it's going to set down. But that's a yeah. cool idea, the mix. Or, yeah. or once we do this cutting into the stone with the, um, with the way we're going to have to do on our, our most recent setting, you might be able to figure out how to do that into your crystal and use a similar make a ring for it and set around the ring. That's another common usage for crystal setting. Yeah, where you where you use a grinding wheel or cutting wheel to get that in place. Cool. Anybody else? Oh, come on. It doesn't have to be stone setting. Just tell me you're making jewelry, people. Making making stuff with metal. <laughs> I did I did make some jewelry. Nice. So, I mean, I posted it on my Instagram. I, I had a challenge of making a bezel. I mean, I'm making a band with cufflinks. Nice. And my friend, well, it's a client. And um, I cut the cufflinks off and then I, I made it into a ring. So it ended up being the gold, just like a twister. Yeah was the cuffling part. I cut that oh. part out and I put it on top and it was a twister ring. So cool. I used gold and metal and then I made two of them. So I didn't realize you, I, when I heard you say that, I thought you meant you made a ring and a matching set of cufflinks. You made a ring out of the set of cufflinks. Oh, yeah, it was his cool. father's. It was his super father's cool. and he wants to give them to his niece. Nice. So... I never work in gold. That's why I was also asking the questions before. Yeah. Yep. Okay. What do you got for us, Suda? Ooh, Ooh. I like that. I, I like it. I don't know. Something is in my way. Can you see me? Yep. So it's yes. moving around a lot. Can you can you hold the piece from, from wobbling? Wow. I can see you guys. Yep. It's there a you tension go. set. So beautiful. Oh, tension. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can Tension see the back from behind even. That's even cooler. Yeah. Wow. Is that a pearl? It's a black pearl, yes. That's a fabulous setting. Thank you. Wow. Tons of variations you can do with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. What gauge metal did you use in order to keep that in place? <laughs> I, I started with 20, but I think um, it, when I textured it, it got a little thinner maybe. Huh. I'm impressed that that's holding because that, oh, so you've got two folded down and two folded up. So it's trapped between them. It's, um, it's a tab the, set. the wider one is in an S shape. So it goes a little in and a little out. So it holds it stronger, both sides. There's two cool. wider ones. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. What a neat setting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, gang, if that is all. Thank then, you so much. We yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, let me yes. tell you what next set it next time we'll be focusing entirely on setting. I'm not <laughs> sure that we'll get through all 20 something stones that we've got in that session, <laughs> but we'll get through a chunk of them faster now that I've given you the basic setting. Um, and I'll be using all those different tools in combinations depending on the stone so that you can see how they each differ in response. Um, and then it seems like probably we'll have to go into the June set, first June session, we'll finish up the setting and we will prep for our prong set chapter four, 
Yay, finally, <laughs> longest chapter ever, chapter three. Um, so yeah, I will see you on the, is it this the third Wednesday? So it must be the first Wednesday of June. Thank you. I just have a question about Facebook group. Where yep. do I find you in Facebook? So the, I put the link back in the top of the chat, but let me see. Let me, you may not have been on then. So I'll post the links again. Yes. And somebody has asked me as a reminder to show you guys where I got that ball vice. So if you want to know that before you leave, give me 30 seconds to okay. check my Amazon history and I will get you the link for that. Okay. Orders. All right, ball vice engraving tool. Here, it, oh, it's $85, my bad, hang on. Uh, not 90 or whatever I said before. Here. There may be a shipping charge, so. Uh, so if you've got Amazon Prime, there's not. Yeah, it is. It is heavy, so there's a bit of a charge if you don't, but there's the Yeah, ball I have Primes. So. Okie doke. Did I forget anything else that I was going to post about? I'll put that in the Facebook group as well. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, gang. Have a good evening and see you next time. Yeah. Have Thank a good you. month. See you Friday. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.